Yes. So please help me welcome Kevin Graff. Kevin, welcome. Um, it's really great to have you here with us today, um, and the floor is now yours. Thanks, Ali, and thanks everybody over at uh, Vend. You guys have done a great job with this whole webinar series and <clears throat> marketing and, and getting this information out there. So thrilled to uh, be a part of that, and to everybody that's on the line, thanks for taking the uh, time out of what are no doubt busy days, uh, because this is a, uh, a worldwide event. I guess I have to say uh, to some of you, good morning, you're just getting out of bed. Some of you, it's the middle of your work day. Uh, others, uh, hang in there, it's probably bedtime for you. But uh, nonetheless, uh, we've got a lot of stuff to be able to get through. Uh, and the first bit of uh, good news that I've got for you is that I've actually bumped this up, but we told you it was going to be 21 proven tactics. We've actually moved it up to 28. There's, there's just so much stuff that uh, we know you can put into place in your stores to be able to drive sales and profitability. You know, it's it's really that you know simple. And the ideas that I'm going to share with you today are really what I call it's kind of like low-hanging fruit. They're, they're easy, practical things that you can do in your stores to really see sort of an immediate dis di difference. Now, some of them take a little bit longer to put into place, but by and large, these aren't going to require you to invest in a lot of different things. They're going to be just things that you could and you should be doing in your stores. You know, and when we think about this, you know, the, the question that you've got to ask yourself is, you know, how much more could you be selling in your store? How much more could you be selling? And I, I've been doing this for a long time. You know, we, we've been doing this for about 27 years. We work with you know great big retail chains with literally thousands of stores, and then some mid-sized chains with you know 100 stores, and then we work with a lot of independents. And this applies to everybody. What I know is what I hope you recognize in your own store, and that is you're leaving a lot of sales on the table every single day and that's really kind of what drives our business and hopefully that drives the potential that you see inside your own business and it's not to say that what you're doing out there now isn't good it's not to say that you're a bad operator but it is to say that we don't sell to every customer that we could that comes into the store and we don't maximize the value of every transaction we could probably sell a little bit more and we could probably get more people coming back to the store and that's what the drive is I mean we think about this all the time I always go how much more could you sell as a percentage and and then I twist it and I always give people different ways of looking at it and one of the ways I challenge people to look at it is I always say think about the best salesperson that's in your store maybe it's you maybe it's somebody else on the schedule and then consider if everybody in the store was as good as that individual how much more could you sell? And suddenly the light bulbs go on and people start to go, wait a minute, I could and should be selling a lot more than what I'm selling today. And that's the beauty of this thing. You take what is hopefully a successful business and now you start to look around and you go, look, selling 5% more just isn't that difficult. 7, 8, 10, 15, 20, 25 in some cases. And we see this happen all the time. So I'm going to walk you through a series of different ideas for you to be able to put in place. I'm going to break these down in terms of different areas. You know, I'm first going to talk about some staff management ideas. Then we're going to talk about things that you should be doing as the owner or the manager. We'll talk a little bit about some traffic building ideas. And then when we get to the end, I'm going to talk to you about some selling tips to be able to cover off. And as Ali was kind enough to mention to you, there is a white paper that's available. You can just click on the little PDF link that's in your little navigation screen. That'll download it for you so that you don't get carpal tunnel trying to write all these ideas down because I understand I talk a little bit fast from time to time and we've got a lot to do. So let's get started. Let's talk about staff management and how it is you can get better productivity out of your staff. This is a huge area that we all need to do a better job at. So uh, let's talk about some of the things that I think you could and should be doing. This very first idea that's going to pop up on your screen in a second talks about setting goals in your store. Now, if, if you were in front of me, uh, I, I'd ask you to raise your hand if you have a daily sales target in your store. Now, it's a pretty wide audience that we've got on the phone, so let's just say it like this. If you don't have a daily sales target in your store today, you're leaving at least 5 to 10 percent on the table, period. Goals drive human performance levels. It drives effort. If you don't have clearly defined goals, whether it's a sales goal or we break it down to individual metrics like average sale, items per sale, conversion rate, products of the day, whatever it is, you're missing the easiest thing there is to do in management. And some of you on the line, not everybody, 
should be tracking individual sales targets, which gets you an even greater bump in productivity because there's nowhere to hide. So step number one is to stop hiding behind the fact that you think goal setting is either too ambiguous, it's too much guesswork, which it's, it's really not, uh, or that if you share the sales results with your team, they don't, they don't quickly want to raise. You need to put goals into place and know that people are on these things. The second part is tracking performance. Talk about your goals at the beginning of the day and then track your performance over the course of the day. There's no sense putting a goal into place at the beginning of the day for your staff and then not talking about it until you get to the end of the day. You have to track it over the course of the day so staff know how they're doing. It's like putting a hand gently on their back and pushing them forward to sell more than they're selling right now. That's step number one. Now, we talked about setting goals. So now let's talk about tracking and coaching key metrics in your store. So most people are all over the sales number. Great. But what are the numbers in behind that that we could and we should be tracking? There is this simple little retail equation that we talk about in stores all the time. It says traffic times your conversion rate percentage times the average per transaction, your average sale. That equals your sales. So traffic is the number of people that come into your store, whether they buy or not. Conversion rate is the percentage of those customers that buy. So if you had 100 people came in and 32 made a purchase, you would have a 32% conversion rate. Really important to understand that number. And then we multiply that by the average amount that each customer spends. Some spend $5, some spend $50. The combination of those things produces your sales. So it makes sense to say that any increase in traffic, conversion rate, or average sale will get you more sales. Now, as simple as that equation is, that's what's being talked about in retail boardrooms around the world every day. How do we get more people in? How do we get more people to buy? How do we get more money out of every individual customer? That's really what the drive is. Now, in your store, these are all really important numbers to track. Now, some of you probably have traffic counters on your store. I always say I wouldn't own a store without a traffic counter because it always starts with how many people come into the store. If I know that, now I know what my conversion rate is, and now I can start to take a look at my average sale, which for the advanced thinkers out there, you know that's a combination of two things. That's the items for sale. The, average number of items that each customer buys and the average unit price, the price point of those items. Sell them more items or sell them more expensive items and your average sale goes up. Those are the metrics that you start to track, those and a whole bunch more. And when suddenly you've got goals in place for those and we start building plans to drive those numbers, we get better results. You know, and the, the, I always give everybody a 30-day challenge. I always say, look, challenge yourself. Pick one of your key metrics. Make it average sale. Make it items per sale. Give yourself 30 days to improve that number by 10%. Come up with a realistic plan. And the funny thing is, almost everybody does it. Because once you understand the number and what goes in behind it, and you start planning towards it, and you're talking to your staff about it, and you're charting it, and you're rewarding it, we're doing all these good things, and suddenly the number starts to move. You start selling more stuff. It's as simple as that. And when we take a look at you know, this example that's going to pop up on your screen in terms of how we drive business, let's say that I had a thousand people walk into the store and my conversion rate was 25% and my average sale was $73. That would get me $18,250. But take a look at this. If the same thousand people come in and my conversion rate stays at just 25%, but I move my average sale up to $76 instead of 73, just a lousy extra three bucks. I sell $19,000, that's a 4% increase in sales. Now let's go backwards. A thousand people come in. I move my conversion rate to 30%. So I, instead of selling to 25 out of 100, I sell to 30 out of 100. So that's only five more customers. Like, don't misunderstand, <laughs> 70 still aren't buying. I still only get $73. Now I sell $21,900. That's a 20% increase in sales. And you can see where the numbers go. If you start moving up your conversion rate, move up your average sale, and suddenly we start to take a look at some pretty big sales gains. Now it's not easy to go from 25 to 30, and it's not easy to go from 73 to 76, but it is designed to show you what's possible in your store. Okay, let's get off the numbers thing for a quick little moment. Let's talk about 
a really best practice that you have to have in place in your stores and you have to be running shift starter meetings. Some people call them daily huddles, uh, gear ups, uh, morning meetings, one minute meetings, rally meetings, they're called all kinds of different things. Whatever they're called, these are the, this is the most important two, three, maybe four minutes of every shift. If you're not running shift starters in your store right now, you are in the definitive minority of retailers that are out there. Think about what we accomplish at a shift starter. We set goals for the staff so they know what's expected. We talk about performance from yesterday so that they either feel great, they get rewarded, <coughs> excuse me, or they feel a better sense of accountability because now they have to try to come up with some ideas on how they could have improved performance. We provide them with a little bit of tra sales training, we give them a little bit of product knowledge, they know what the promotions are, and they all go out with a better sense of what's supposed to happen. And you can contrast that with the store that doesn't run shift starters where people just come meandering in and you know what the process is, they kind of go through the opening procedures and they, they slowly get into the day. It's not effective at all. These have to run at the beginning of every shift, not just the beginning of the day, the beginning of every shift. So if you have people coming in at 9, 11, 1, 3, and 6, it happens at the beginning. And we can show you a really simple way to be able to do that, but you have to get these things put in place in your stores. Now, uh, if you want a free kit on how to run shift starter meetings, just send us an email. I'll send one off to you. There's no charge. There's no hook on this thing. Uh, they're just they're, they're simple. There's a form in there. We'll give you the instructions. Uh, send us an email. I will gladly share that with you uh, at no added cost. So get that email address down and you'll be all set. Okay, let's move on because we've got a lot of ideas to be able to get through. Um, the next one, and it really relates to something that you're going to do in the shift starters, talks about PK training. That's product knowledge training every single day. What I want you to do is get everybody's product no knowledge score up. Your customers are more knowledgeable and demanding, therefore your staff have to be more knowledgeable as well. You know, too often your customers walk in and they know more about your products than your staff do. So we've got to do a bit better job of product knowledge. And we could do some really big complicated things, but let's talk about the most simple thing you could do. Every day have a product of the day. And use it, the shift starter is the form to be able to share this with your staff. Just rotate it around the store, pick a product, I sign it to a staff to be able to explain it to the rest of the staff that day where they talk about the key features and benefits of that product. They talk about how to sell it. They talk about what customers most likely to buy that product, what we add on to it, and what we switch off over to when it's not the right thing for the customer. One minute is all it takes. Now, at the end of one day, you've only gone over one product. At the end of the week, it's just seven. But you know what? At the end of three months, you've gone through 90 products. At the end of six months, you've gone through 180 products. And suddenly, we get this pitter-patter going in the store that really starts to be able to drive product knowledge higher. It's the easiest thing to do, and it works really well. On the same training front, a minute of sales training every single day at the shift starter. Have a sales tip of the day. You know, at some point, I'm sure it's going to come up. Well, you know, it, you know, Ali mentioned, you know, our online training. One of the things we do, we send out a sales tip every day to every one of our clients. That's just one of the things that we do. But imagine if you did a role play every day at a shift starter. Imagine if you talked about a different selling scenario. Imagine if you talked about a different add-on strategy. Imagine if you talked about the objection of the day and how to overcome it. Imagine how suddenly your staff start to think more critically about how it is they're dealing with your customers. You start to create, it's not the only thing you can do, but you start to create this sales culture in your store. You start to create this ongoing dialogue, this ongoing conversation of how your staff are selling to your customers. And when we do that, that's when we win. When, when we get to the end of this webinar, I'm going to come back and I'll talk to you about a lot more sales ideas that you could be able to put into place in your store that will really make a difference. But you've got to know that you've got to be doing the sales training all the time. All right, next idea. Let's start to run daily contests in our store. And you may not have to run one of these things every day, but let me tell you, you need to have something going at least once and probably twice a week in your store. You know, for retail staff, working a three hour or a six hour or an eight hour shift, working five days a week, you running a store 362 days a year, it's long. 
give your staff a reason to get a little more excited and at the same time you can encourage them to apply the right sales behavior. So if I'm looking to drive up items for sale, my contests reward adding on behaviors. So it's, you know, they, they earn points or they earn, you know, chits for every three or five item sale that they make. If I'm looking to drive up the sale of more expensive products, I can put a contest together on that, right? So you, the contest can dictate the behaviors that you're looking to be able to encourage in your staff. And it's not hard to come up with these contests. You know, I, I, t I tell people this all the time. Sit down with a piece of paper, come up with 12 or 24 different simple little contests. And, and keep in mind, the best contests in retail are one shift long. I always say everybody's got ADD in retail out there, but it's like one shift long where the payout's at the end of the day. Now, come up with 12 or 15 or 20 of these things. Put them on a calendar and start to roll them. And when you get to the end, you just recycle these things and put them through again. And next thing you know, you've got this well thought out approach to running contests in your store that cost you next to nothing, but suddenly make working in the store way more fun, way more rewarding. So don't forget to put your contests in place. All right, moving on. Uh, next tip uh, is to offer a product of the day. Uh, easiest extra two bucks or five bucks you'll ever get from any customer is at the point of sale. Once the customer's already committed to buying something from you and they're up at the register and their credit card's out, their cash is out, and your cashiers are suddenly selling the way they are supposed to be selling, it's the easiest thing in the world. It's the easiest thing in the world. Now, to make this work though, you have to get the people who are working on cash to offer this product, to try to sell it. You know, I talked about cashiers, their job is to sell. You know, and depending on the structure of store that you're running, I, I say this to everybody, your cashiers are the cleanest form of salesperson that you have. It's just them and the customer. They're not just there to be efficient with, you know, processing the transaction. Their job is to establish the relationship, to ensure the customer feels warm and fuzzy so they want to come back to your store, and to suggest product of the day. Give every cashier a goal, get a chart up in the back room, track how they're doing on these things, teach them the magic little words to be able to introduce it to the customer, come up with a little contest for the person that sells the most of these items, and the next thing you know, you drive up your average sale by 50 cents, 75 cents, a dollar. The trick to the products of the day, and you probably already know this, keep them, depends on your store, relatively inexpensive. So in some stores it's like a two dollar item, in other stores it's five dollars. If you are a fashion store selling more expensive stuff, it could be as much as a fifteen or twenty dollar item. But keep it a, a simple little discussion. Keep it to be an item that's got wide appeal so the impulse factor is easy to be able to understand. And more often than not, these products have great big margin attached to them. So you want to be able to push these things out the door. They don't sell just because you put them up on the cash lane. They sell because your cashiers enact with your customers and get these things out the door. Easy, low-hanging fruit for you to be able to do. Let's get just a couple of the uh, tougher points that I want to cover off with you about managing your staff. <laughs> and this one says to drop the duds. I, uh, you know, it, it's a jargon term, that, but I'm pretty sure everywhere you are in the world, you know what I mean when I say duds. I'm talking about those staff members that are happily taking your money in salary and or wages, but are not giving you an equal return for that money. Uh, these are the individuals that, honestly, they, they might be a great person, but they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. So. I tell people, give yourself an incredibly short window to fix or improve this person or get them off the schedule. Make a commitment to doing everything you can to fix this, this person because I'd rather you fix them than get rid of them. It's way less expensive to fix them than it is to get rid of them and then hire somebody else. But give yourself a window of no more than six to seven weeks to get working on this person. Do everything that you can do. Might not be everything that a great big retailer could do with huge resources behind them, but do everything that you can legitimately do to make this person successful. But at the end of the day, if they've made the decision not to be successful in your store, get them off the schedule. 
because you are driving down the performance of not just that person, but everybody else around them. You're driving down the performance of the store. You're subjecting some poor, unsuspecting customer to this dud out there. You're subjecting all your other staff to having to work with this person who's a terrible teammate. Get them off your schedule as fast as you can. Replace them with somebody that's going to do the job they're supposed to. And the bigger the store that you are, you, you can extend that time a little bit. The smaller the store you are and you're working with on average four, six, or eight people, you can't afford to have anybody in your store that is not pulling their way. Get serious about performance out there. And the next one that's going to come up on your screen goes along that exact same line. Demand compliance on your standards. Look, there is only one way to run your store, and that's the right way. Your standards, those are those list of minimum non-negotiable behaviors that you have for your store. They're minimums. They're not great big high level things. They're minimum things, but they are non-negotiable things. And I and I, and I talk to retailers all the time, and I, I could talk about this point for, for, for three hours with you to talk to you about what this really means and how you go about solving this. But look, if you thought about all your standards, your housekeeping standards, your merchandising standards, your service standards, your selling standards, loss prevention standards, dress code standards, administrative standards, and you thought about all those things and you put them all in a hat and you stirred it around and you had to give yourself a score on compliance on a scale of 1 to 10. 10 means we're perfect, we don't suffer from any non-compliance, and you work your way down. If you're like everybody else on the line, you're probably thinking you're anywhere between a 5 and a 7. Some of you might be an 8. But make no mistake about it, the only acceptable score on compliance on standards is a 10 out of 10. Think about it. Minimum non-negotiable expectations. Minimum. So these aren't high things and they are non-negotiable. So what are you saying when you say that you're at a 5, 6, or 7? It's that you can't even achieve the minimum in your store. And I'm not looking to dump on you, but this is kind of that little kick on kick in the butt that says, wait a minute, <clears throat> you got the right to run your store the right way. You do. And you're not being a big bad bully, and you're not being a nasty boss. You're, you're simply saying, guys, look, we're going to operate this store with a higher degree of pride. We're going to run this thing the way it's supposed to to be run. Nobody's going to argue with you about that. Like, you know, getting your staff to say, okay, I'm going to show up on time. Well, there's a biggie. Uh, wear my uniform the way it's supposed to be worn. Okay, well, that's not hard. Uh, if I walk by a customer, I'm going to look up, smile, and say, hi. like, none of these things are particularly challenging. And think about what would happen to your stress level as the manager, as the owner, as the operator, if all of a sudden you were at a 10 out of 10. You could get on with growing the business. Now, it occurs to me that one of the biggest problems is that most people don't have their standards written down. Like I ask people if I had to say, could you come up with your top 10 standards? And it's, it, you know, I give them a piece of paper and they start working on it. It's like, it's like the first time they're doing it and it's really challenging. And then I always go, stop. If you don't know what the top 10 are, how will your staff know what the top 10 are? And I tell everybody all the time, just take the time jot down a list of standards so that you can talk about them. And that little snapshot, that's just something I saw in somebody's back room. It's one of the one of our clients here over in Canada. And these don't have to be your store standards. You know, but you look at this stuff. You know, number one, we'll greet every customer who walks through the door. Well, that's, that, that, that's not earth shattering. We'll take customers to the products they're looking for and not just point them in the direction. We're going to keep our store clean, including the floors are swept, wash and clean. And you go down this stuff and you kind of go, okay, well, there, 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 there's no rocket science here. There's nothing controversial on here, but now if you have this written down, you and your staff can work towards that. You can have a standard of the day where you say, guys, okay, today we're working on you know, point number two. That, that's the thing we want to talk about to make sure we're getting good at it. And the next day you're working on point number nine. Right? Nobody's going to eat or drink on the service floor, keeping snacks and drinks behind the counter and out of the customer site. Like, really? But if that's one of our standards, and then you go down this list or your list and you get those 10 things right, you go, oh my God, we're running a better store. And if you can get those 10 things right, then add three more. And when you get those three right, add three more. And the next thing you know, your store just gets better all the time. Run your store the right way. 
All right, let's move to some like cheerier topics because uh, those ones are always like a little cranky uh, to be able to talk to you about. Uh, encourage gift card purchases. Uh, I always say, you know, gift cards are, you know, God's gift to retail, you know, for any number of reasons. You know, you, you think about it, you know, what, you know, we know that not every dollar gets redeemed on gift cards. We know that if you give somebody a $25 gift card, odds are they're going to probably come in and spend the $25 plus a little bit more. And on top of that, they give you the money and they don't take any product from your store. So it's kind of like giving you a cash advance that you get to now play with. And then later on, who knows, maybe a week, three weeks, three months later, they come in and redeem it for the product that they're entitled to. But you've got to encourage these things always. And I, and I see retailers selling these things, and some people do a really good job. And more often than not, it's just kind of a benign sale where they're there, and if a customer asks for it, we'll sell it to you. But it should be part of your add-on strategy, right? It should be part of that last little bit that you do with a customer is to suggest a gift card so that they've got a gift available in case somebody gives them one. It's a nice little added thing to be able to sell to them. It's a great thing to be able to sell to a customer that's been in the store that hasn't made a purchase and it's on their way out the store. Maybe that's the thing that you do, but do a better job of being proactive with your gift cards. And next thing you know, you're gonna discover you're gonna get a bump in the number of gift cards that you're selling and that all translates into more dollars for your store. Uh, the next point is one that for obvious reasons, I'm fairly passionate about. It's more training and coaching for everyone. Uh, and this this point's gonna come up sort of repeatedly in here. You, you think about what's going on, gone on, and this has gone on around the world. This isn't unique to North America. This happens everywhere. Because of the web, because of online shopping, because of the increased amount of competition that we have, your customers expect more. They're more knowledgeable. When, when, when they walk into your store, they're more demanding. They've done all their research online. They know what's going on in the marketplace. The staff bear the burden of that increased expectation. And we, I, I go to conferences all the time. I speak at these things and the theme comes up repeatedly. Brick and mortar retail is going to be just fine. It's, it's here to stay, don't worry. However, to survive as brick and mortar, you have to perform at a higher level. As it relates to the point that I'm talking about now, it means that everybody that's going to be in that store has to operate significantly higher than they're performing right now. Store managers have to be way smarter, way more productive, way more efficient, way more systematic, provide a better work experience for the employees, and the staff have to be so amazing with their service their sales skills, and their product knowledge. So that when now all of a sudden that customer comes in, yes, the merchandising has to be great. Yes, the music has to be great. Yes, the store design has to be awesome. But the staff have to match that. They, they can't just clerk the sale. They can't just be eh, an afterthought out there anymore. Take a look at what you've got in the cupboards for training and coaching right now. And if you're not proud of what you see in there, Get out there and find things to put in the cupboards and execute that stuff at a really high level. It will come back to you over and over and over again. Drive this thing to a much higher level. Uh, next point's a nice easy one for you to be able to wrap your heads around on here. Uh, if you were a client of mine, um, you'd have a great big sales board in the back of your store. You know, We would find the biggest piece of real estate that's available on a wall in the back. And we would make it all about sales. You know, there would be a big sales chart in the middle, 1 to 31, the whole month. I'd have last year's sales, what the target was, what we actually did, key metrics on there would all be colored up, highlighted up, starred up. Uh, I'd have all my sales tips around the outside, some product knowledge. Anything to do with sales would be on that board. I don't want staff to miss it. You know, I always say to my clients, you know, if I go in the back room and it's all about, you know, health and safety, but there's nothing up there about sales, I go, well, that's great. Nobody's, no, nobody's going to run with scissors, but nobody's going to sell anything either. You know, we're in the business of selling some stuff, so let's talk about sales. So challenge yourself. What's, what's up on the back wall? Because whatever's back there is probably what your staff are going to recognize as being near and dear to you. And look, if you're going to put it up on the back wall, make sure you keep it up to date. Because if you got this thing up there and you've got a sale 
sales chart up there and you go four days or you go a week and you don't update it, your staff see that you're just taking a shortcut and you're not that committed to it. You know, one of the little tricks to keeping those sales boards up to date is get your staff to update it. Give somebody that job every week and rotate it around and now they've got to confront what the reality is of the business and it also gets done. As a manager, as an owner, I know you get busy so you can get them more involved with that. All right, let me give you a few management ideas. Let's move off all the staff stuff and let's talk about some things. These are really designed for the owners that we've got on the line today uh, because a couple of these ideas you may not be able to enact if you're a store manager that's on the line. You kind of need management control, not for all of them, but for some of them. You know, the first idea that's going to come up here uh, really speaks to anybody, you know, owners, managers. Uh, it says, you know, get out on the sales floor every day. You know, one of the traps I see happening all the time is, you know, we make you a manager or we make you an owner, we give you a nice little office in the back and you hang out back there. And you're doing really important stuff, I know, like paperwork. Um, but look, make no mistake about it. Your customers, your staff and the product are out on the sales floor. We make money out on the sales floor. We typically spend it in the back room. Get out on the sales floor. You know, the, 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 the hardest skill to find, to nurture in a retail store is being a good merchant, somebody that really knows how to drive the sales floor. The paperwork stuff, the old A plus B plus C equals D stuff, I mean, it's a lot easier for me to train somebody how to do that stuff. That's, that's kind of like fill in the blank stuff. But watching staff, coaching staff, leading staff, mentoring staff, watching traffic flow, modeling for your staff how you're supposed to be selling to customers out there, understanding what's really going on with the product, listening to feedback about it. That's the stuff that drives the business. We can't do that from the back room. So I just tell everybody, look, whatever time you're spending in the back room, cut it in half, figure out <clears throat> some way of delegating some of that stuff, <laughs> take it home with you. That's a, that's a great idea. <laughs> um, um, but get out on the sales floor. That's where the action is, and that's always how we're going to drive the business to a higher level. And to that same degree of getting out on the sales floor, you need to go out and shop the competition. You can't sit back in your store and operate in a vacuum. The level of competition out there is crazy. One of the great things about the internet is you can normally just log on <coughs> to your competition site and see what they're at least talking to their customers about. That's great, but it's no substitute for actually walking down the hallway, driving down the block, and going and taking a look at the outside of their store. Don't be hesitant. Walk into the store, see what's going on. Excuse me, because you know that's exactly what your customers are doing. So you've got to level the playing field. If your customers are doing it, you need to be on top of it as well. So take the point of being able <coughs> to do that. Okay, the next point. Uh, it, it's one of my favorite points for independent retailers. For all the chain retailers that are on the line, if you're a store manager or a district manager, this one's not for you because this probably falls outside your scope, so don't be racing back and saying, hey, Graf said to round up all our prices. Um, th th they've got that. But for all the independents that are on the line, I see some goofy prices <clears throat> Excuse me, on a lot of products that are out there where we're just we're just giving away stuff. Now I know you can't raise the prices on some products because you'll tell me that they're price sensitive and customers know it. Great, terrific. <clears throat> if it's price sensitive and moving it up 50 cents would mean you're not going to sell as much, then don't do it. But that doesn't apply to the vast majority of products that are in your store. So <clears throat> take a look at the chart that's there. I say, okay, if I assumed my original gross margin was 40%, if my initial price was $52.99 and I rounded it up to $54.99, <clears throat> if that's not a price sensitive item, I'm not going to sell any less at $54.99. I'm going to make an extra, extra two bucks and instead of a 40% margin, I'm now at 42.2. $9.69, absolutely ridiculous price tag, right? Unless it's price sensitive. I'm not going to sell any less at $9.99. It's 30 cents more. My margin is now 41.8, not 40. You know, 11.69, 11.99. Not going to sell any less. Extra 30 bucks, 41.5. Go around your store and take a look at it and just challenge yourself. What are those goofy prices that you have where you can just round it up and you'd probably make an extra point or two? And in the battle of trying to drive margin, getting an extra point, point and a half, two points. That's huge. You know, everybody talks about Walmart. Walmart is the master of variable pricing. 
you know, everybody says, well, they're so tough on pricing. Yeah, they're very tough on pricing on price sensitive items. So the stuff that's up and down the aisles, that's on the end caps, incredibly well priced. But they know you have no clue what the price of contact cement is supposed to be. So when you end up in the hardware aisle and for comp convenience reasons, you pick up the contact cement, odds are pretty good. You're probably paying a little bit more for that than you could down the block because they know that's not a price sensitive item. They're smart enough to know, look, I'm just going to round up the price. They're not going to gouge you, but they're going to make an extra 20 cents, 30 cents, 40 cents, 50 cents <clears throat> on that item. And that's what's driving the profitability of the business. So go around and check to see what your prices look like and guaranteed you can make more money by rounding up some of those things. Nail down your best sellers. Um, Retail <clears throat> can be a little complicated, but there's some things we do out there that are incredibly simple. Uh, once you know something's a bestseller, for goodness sakes, never run out of it, uh, or do your very best never to run out of it. Uh, bug your supplier well in advance, nag them, <laughs> find an alternative supplier. It's so hard to find a bestseller. When you have something, don't get caught with it out of stock. We do so much experimentation. You go to a buying show, somebody tricks you into buying some product that looked really good. I mean, it's because the staff are really good at selling it to you. Um, <clears throat> you bring it into your store, and it sits there. Okay, great. I get it. We have to experiment. We have to try to constantly find a new revenue stream. But that's not at the expense of our best sellers because the moment I run out of stock on a best seller, well, now I'm incredibly pooched all the time. Uh, the next point that comes up, challenge every expense in your business. I'm going to give you this little example um, of what challenging expenses really means to your bottom line from a relative perspective. Now I know that most retailers have already done a really great job of kind of like paring down most every expense possible. If you're, if you're on the line, you're in a big chain, that's been an ongoing process and we've done a great job of getting those costs out of the, bis out of the business. Um, but let me give this to you from this very small perspective. Let's say <clears throat> that I could figure out a way to save $200 a month in expenses. So you go looking around and you go, wait a minute, I want to be able to shave 200 bucks a month out of my expenses. How could you do it? Now don't be like everybody and go to wages right away, <laughs> but you might. You might go to advertising, I get it, but I, get, like, I, I run a small office. Uh, we made a small change, very small change. We, we just switched to runs all of our uh, wireless phones for us in the office and we only have, I think, we have five, <clears throat> I think, on contract right now. I made a change. I say $500 a month. $500 a month goes into my pocket. And then we made another change. I changed all of our internet and all of our phone providers. I saved another $150 a month. The point that I'm making is you can look around, you can find these expense savings periodically in your business. But what does that really mean? Well, if I save $2,400 a month, <clears throat> or $200 a month, that's the same as $2,400 a year. That's the same as having to sell $48,000 in sales based on a bottom line of 5% of sales. And most of you on the line are running on a bottom line of, you know, 3 to 5 to 8, maybe 10% on the bottom line. 5% of 48,000 is 2400 bucks. So you tell me, is it easier to save 2400 bucks or to sell $48,000 in products? And the answer of course normally is to get after it and start to save the money where you can save the money. It's just a constant reminder of how money flows to the bottom line. So really get out there and take a look at those expenses. The next point is an incredibly depressing one, uh, but it's a really important one. We've got to be able to clamp down on shrinkus. And I, I saw that sign that's there, you know, you get a free ride in a police card if you shoplift from this store. Compliments of the police department. Uh, shrinkage is, it, it, it's a nasty bit of business. Uh, to say the least. We've done a great job in retail, in all honesty. Uh, since, since I got in this business 27 years ago, shrink rates have come down for the most part every year, uh, where we're now typically running a little less than 1% out there. But if, if, in case you don't know what shrink is, your book on the books, it tells you how much inventory you're supposed to have. You count it and there's less than that. That's your shrink. So the question is, you know, where is it going? And this some people don't want to believe this. They throw up their hands and say, that can't possibly be true. Uh, your employees are stealing the vast majority of it. 
most people think, oh, that couldn't possibly be true. True, in almost every store, the employees outsteal everybody else. Uh, customers are stealing some. Uh, there's a lot of paperwork errors out there, and then there's a few other things uh, like damages and unnecessary uh, illegal markdowns, those type of things. Um, so you've got to be able to, you know, stamp this stuff out. And this isn't a loss prevention webinar. There's people out there that do it. We used to do this when we started our company a long time ago, and then we stopped doing it because it's just too depressing. Because I'm looking at staff, and I'm thinking, well, you're stealing, and well, you might be stealing, and you might be stealing, and you know, you start to look at it. But you can clamp these things down. You know, there's some simple things that you can do to reduce employee theft. You know, clear garbage bags. You know, no boxes go out unless they're completely broken down. Two people have to throw out the garbage at the same time. Track voids and no sales by employee because suddenly you discover that Susie's doing way more no sales than everybody else. Doesn't mean she's stealing, but it means she's opening that registered drawer for some reason that nobody else has to. So I want to know about those things. Track refunds by employee. Call back customers periodically about refunds. See if it was really a refund because people like palm receipts all the time in stores. There's, uh, there's hundreds of ideas of things that you can do to drive this down but you have to be able to get it down. The math on this stuff is really, really, really scary. You know, if I gave you some assumptions to be able to work with as I go through this example, let's assume that we were running a $2 million store. So if I have a 1% shrinkage rate, that's $20,000 in losses. And let's assume that I have a 5% bottom line. <clears throat> Here's what the reality is. I need to generate $400,000 in added sales to cover that loss. If I'm losing $20,000, I have to generate $400,000 in sales to cover that loss. 5% of 400000 is $20,000. And if that number doesn't move you to get serious about loss prevention and stamping this thing out, I don't know what will. All right, I got to get moving because we still got lots of ideas to be able to get through and I've got about uh, oh, a little less than 15 minutes to do it. So some of these are going to go really, really fast. Traffic building ideas. Um, the very first slide, I've actually jam five points on this one slide just because I think you know we could get through this a little bit quicker um, <clears throat> if we want more traffic coming into our store uh, provide better service that's obvious you know what give me a good reason to come back to the store because I really like you guys in the store you know if you give me a mundane shopping experience why would I want to come back great windows right people are walking by they're driving by your windows have to be amazing go and take a look at the leading retailers take a look at how great their windows take a look at how exciting their entire storefronts are they're fresh they're exciting all the time look busy in your store you notice that when you're busy you get busy when nobody's in the store nobody wants to come in the store you know like stop hanging around the cash desk stop hanging out at the back of the store go up to the front of the store put some product in the box start taking it out of the box look busy get on the phone call your best customers you know, if, if they're your best customers, give them a good reason to, you know, come back to the store. You know what they like. It's in the store. You know they're a sale customer. You've got stuff that's on sale. Pick up the phone and call these individuals. It's a bit of a lost art. It's not an intrusion if you've got rapport with your customer all the time. You know, the, the, the next point that's going to come out, this is a scary one because it's where retail is going. Every, every store almost looks like a flagship store that's out there. Uh, you got to make your store look like it's worth coming into. You know, I, I challenge people all the time, go stand outside your store and take a look at it and just ask yourself the question, you know, would you shop here? Would you walk into the store? Now, you know, you probably can't, you know, you know, invest six hundred thousand dollars in renovating your storefront like some people can however you can clean it up and you can fix your windows and you can do better displays and you can do something that's a little more interactive to give your customers a reason to come in uh, the next point community-based marketing uh, one of the things I'm incredibly proud of is how involved with communities a lot of retailers are um, I don't think a lot of retailers do a great job of marketing out all their good deeds, which is a missed opportunity. But there's so much good that you can do in your community that comes back to you. And this really applies to the independents that are on the line. Get involved with the community. I know a, a retailer in the one town over from here drives her entire business, I swear, off of community-based marketing events. Everybody in the community loves the store. Why? It's not because of the products and it's not because of the prices. She's got a nice little product selection. She's got decent prices. <coughs> Excuse me. But 
it's sticky. Everybody feels a commitment to going into that store. So look for ways that you can get involved in the community. And now we get to our last points on here. It's a good thing because I think my voice is going to give out in the next little while. Uh, selling tips. We do a lot of sales training. We started the company back in 88 just teaching people how to sell. Um, so we've got a little bit of information and a whole lot of insight into how to sell more. And what I know is that selling is not something that anybody is really born into. It's, it, it, it's a definitive science in terms of how we go about establishing rapport with the customer, how we develop likability, how it is we can do a better job <coughs> of driving the business. So let's get started. First and foremost, and this is the thing that shocks me the most with retailers, is that you have to actually learn how to sell. And it's that big dope moment for a lot of people where, you know, you're running a business that survives based on your ability to put sales in the register. Yet, <clears throat> the majority of retailers that I deal with haven't actually trained themselves or their staff how to sell. And it's this ridiculous gap. It's like going to somebody that's going to cut your hair, but they've never actually learned how to cut hair. It's like getting somebody to fix the brakes on your car, but they've never really, really learned how to repair brakes on a car. So now all of a sudden we look at it and we kind of go, wait a minute, have you learned how to sell? And if you haven't actually put into place a sales training program to stop what you're doing, go out and find one, research one, read about one, do something to actually teach your staff how to sell. It comes back to you in spades, like in spades and spades and spades, learn how to sell. Now, some of the things that I can share with you <clears throat> to help you sell a lot more right away. Uh, simple little selling tips. Number one, rapport is everything in the world of selling. The reason, the 70% reason that you will or won't make a sale to a customer normally is tied to your rapport with the customer. You see, customers buy from people that they trust and they trust people that they like. It's as simple as that. Like leads to trust, leads to buy. So the question is, how likable are you and your staff? And there are so many things that you can do to be way more likable to your customers. You just need to work on it. And you tell them, slow down. Be a real person when you go wait on the customer. No more can I help you. You know, no more cheesy sales lines. Like just slow down, be a real person going over to talk to another real person. Laugh, joke around, talk about social things. Right? Before we get into the business of the business, I what they're looking for today, let's just develop a little bit of humanity between each other. And when we do that, they relax, you relax, and now we start to sell much better. Ask more questions is the next point. Uh, we are doing way more selling when we're asking questions than when we are talking about the products. Way more. This is the hardest part of selling. Rapport is the most important. Not that hard to do. Most people mess it up. Not that hard to do. Asking questions, really, really hard to do this really well because most people just do this by the seat of their pants and as a result, don't ask enough questions. It's normally you walk into a store, you get two questions and the customer, make, uh, the staff makes a recommendation, which is just it's the equivalent of throwing the product against the wall and hoping it's going to stick. You know, solutions-based selling says no. The more you can understand about your customer, <clears throat> what their hopes, wants, needs, fears are, more that you can understand about their previous experiences, what they're looking for, what they've seen already in the market, the more we can delve into that. Now when we talk about a product, we're presenting it as a solution to that customer. And it makes perfect sense that that's how we're going to drive better customer satisfaction make better recommendation, but more importantly, present the right solution every time. You know, I tell everybody, pre-think all the questions. You know, go around your store, take a look at the five main categories of items that you sell. Think about what are those five, 10, 15 questions you should ask a customer <clears throat> for each of those common sales. Write them down, post them, start to memorize them. The moment you start to do that, that's when people start to ask more questions. That's when it really works. The next point really relates to helping you sell more items to every customer. You have to have an add-on strategy. You have to have an add-on strategy. So what I mean by that is 
when you're in the store and you've successfully established rapport, you've asked tons of great questions, you've presented a winning product, you know the customer likes that product, now I want to sell them a second, a third, a fourth, and a fifth item. <clears throat> That's my add-on strategy. But it doesn't just happen. And the, what I know is that if I give you a real clear strategy to follow when you're an employee, you will do a better job of actually executing. So I'm going to put up on the screen in a second an example add-on strategy. I'm not saying this is the one that you should use, but it gives you an example of what you could use on the floor. So I'm with a customer. <clears throat> First thing I want to do is trade them up to a higher priced item if it makes sense. Uh, this one is for a fashion store. Secondly, I want to be able to complete the look. So, you know, they're buying a pair of pants. Well, they're probably not just going to wear the pants. So they're probably going to need a belt. They're probably going to need a shirt, maybe some socks, right? Maybe a jacket to go with it. Like, it depends. But let's complete the look. Third, wardrobing. Again, fashion-related example. Wardrobing. All right, so they got that pair of pants, sold them a shirt. You know what? This shirt over here would get you way more use out of those pants. That's wardrobing. So now I start to show you how they can get more use out of it. Fourth, promo items. So now I've sold them all the stuff that I possibly can. They've got this great look going. They've got accessories to go with it, promo items. I've got stuff on sale in the store. For goodness sakes, point out the stuff that's on sale. <clears throat> it works really well when we put something on sale, but it works great when the sales staff point it out. So now you're on the way to the cash desk. You point out to the customer, you know, we've got some great buys over on this rack. You may want to have a look in there. I think there's some stuff that you would see that you may actually like. And then finally, up at the cash desk, that's that product of the day. We have to have a sale item. Now, you look at that five steps in there. If I work through one, two, three, four, five of those steps, I don't expect the customer to say yes at each one of those. But I know if I go through five of those, I'm probably going to get two, maybe three yeses along the way. And now, all of a sudden, I've got like a four or five item sale. If I just went through one add-on strategy on there, the odds of me getting that one add-on strategy, not so great. If I work through a bunch of things in a non-aggressive, customer-focused way, I'll do infinitely better. The next point, <clears throat> everybody's knocked off this little uh, image out there, so we thought we'd knock it off. You have to have a sense of urgency, a greater sense of urgency in the store to actually make a sale. If you worked, <laughs> you got to fight the, the complacency that happens in a store. So let me, let me give it to you like this. Retail typically has a lot of traffic that comes into the store. We combine that with the fact that a lot of retail stores have a bit of a lower conversion rate in the store. So we go, if this customer doesn't buy, that's okay, the next customer probably will. And if that doesn't buy, the next one will, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And because we get all this traffic coming in, and what we go is, we say, no, 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 <clears throat> we have to try a little bit harder, not aggressively, with every single customer in the store. We have to push it harder. We have to drive it a little harder. And we create that sense of urgency in the store when we put goals into place. We start to track and share results. We boost accountability levels. We put some contests into place. People get a little more excited about getting to a customer number one and actually trying a little bit harder to satisfy those customers' needs. You know, ignoring a customer is not a sense of urgency. Going over to a customer and going, if you need any help, I'll be right over here, is not a sense of urgency. Let's work on getting our staff to be more committed to going and making the sale. And the last point that I've got for you is that you've got to make work fun. You've got to make it really, really fun to be out there. If, you know, retail's supposed to be fun. If you're having fun in the store, that means your customers are probably having fun. If they're having fun, they're probably staying longer. They're probably buying more in the store. So look around your store. If you and your staff are not smiling and laughing all day long, it's broken. You need to fix it, right? This is kind of like your permission to just go out there and have some fun and to joke around, to include your customers in that fun. And we do when we do that, that's when we'll drive it. Whew, there we have it. That's 28 proven tactics to increase your sales and your profitability in your store. And as I said to you, that's all really kind of like low hanging fruit, easy, simple ideas. Find five, six, seven of those ideas that we went through, download the white paper, take a look at it, put them into place, guaranteed you and your staff are going to start to be more successful. You'll start to sell more stuff 
in the store. Um, I'm get, give me 60 seconds. I'm going to just tell you, you know, just a tiny, tiny little bit about graph retail, you know, and why retailers everywhere, and I mean everywhere, we work around the world, uh, hire us. You know, I mentioned to you that we've been doing this for 27 years and counting, and we just work with retailers. So to say we get retailer would be a bit of an understatement. Uh, we only do three things, and that's it, but we do three things really well. We teach salespeople how to sell a lot more. We teach store managers how to manage their staff better and to get better results. And we teach district managers how to manage a territory of stores, which is nothing like managing one store out there. And the other reason everybody hires us out there is we've got the leading online sales and management training system out there for retailers. It's what we call Graph Retail TV. Um, Thousands of stores around the world use this. Uh, one, because it works. Uh, two, because it is incredibly inexpensive. You know, typically you can provide all the sales training you want for about two bucks a day in a store, and, and that's it. All the management training you could ever want to teach your managers finally how to manage, all for about two bucks a day. If you want to learn more about that, um, just you know, go online. Uh, it'll pop up on your screen. If you go onto our website, graphretail.tv, not .com, but .tv, uh, you can you go surfing through the site. You'll get to this page. If you want to book a demo uh, to see how it works and learn a little bit more about that, just fill out the little form that's there, click it. Mary Gordon, probably in my office, will be who's the one that you'll deal with. She's to totally, totally awesome. Um, she'll just you know get you online and explain to you how it works, get you a bit of a demo. If it makes sense for you, great. Uh, it's just a way of being able to help you drive more business into your store. That's it. That's what I've got to say to you. So, Ali, let me bring it back over to you and Great. see if we've got any questions. Great. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, it was a pleasure. Um, so, yeah, we do have a few questions that we will be going over right now um, during the time that we have. Um, so, the first question that we had um, is, so if you are in a retail business, so, for example, selling mattresses, where you only get about two to five customers a day and sometimes none, how do you keep staff motivated where the average tickets are typically higher than the average commodity? Um, and can daily targets not be demotivating in that case? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. We run into that a lot because we do work in that category. Mm -hmm. uh, low traffic environments, a uh, little bit lower conversion rates. How do you keep the staff motivated? <clears throat> Let me answer first. Uh, daily sales targets. No, they can't. I mean, can they be demotivated? I suppose if you're not setting them right, if you set them too high. Uh, here's what we know. Weekly targets are more important than the day and monthly targets are more important than the week. Doesn't mean we don't set daily targets, but it's just this process of you know doing proper management when you put it into place, showing staff, here's what we need to do for the month. So to do that, this is probably what we need to do for the week. So let's just keep track of it as we go through the day. The process of keeping staff up there, it relates to that point, relates to that point of urgency. And that's that thing where if you're incredibly goal driven and you're tracking performance and staff know they have to hit their sales targets, man, I'll tell you when those two or three customers get in the store, the staff tend to hustle a little bit more to get to them and try a little bit harder because they know there's going to be a long lull before they see more customers coming into the store. We need to work with higher conversion rates. Therefore, and I, and I say this all the time, you know, staff in those environments need to be awesome at selling, right? Like there's a retailer here in Canada, the country, their staff are typically terrific that when you walk in the store, all kinds of training, all kinds of orientation, all kinds of sales management process into the place. When you walk in the store, I'm telling you, you typically get outstanding service and salesmanship. Great, awesome. Yeah, um, I definitely agree with that, and um, we definitely have we have a few more questions um, for the time that we have here. So the second question is: um, so we are in a business where we get a lot of returns and exchanges. So how do we cut down on this? And is it a good idea to mention the return policy during a sale? Okay, uh, returns and exchanges. Okay, so first and foremost, uh, everybody on the line should have at this stage of the game a very liberal, very open-ended uh, return policy. Um, we. <laughs> It's, it's just a competitive strategy out there. And people who are concerned about returns and exchanges, I always remind them what they're spending on credit card costs for the privilege of accepting credit cards is infinitely, is costing them way, way, way more money than bad returns and exchanges. Should we mention it during the sale? Yeah, absolutely. We use it as a sales tool, right? We let customers know that we've got a, you know, no questions asked return policy. Bring it back within a period of time, whatever your stipulation is. 
but if you want to cut down on returns and exchanges, and it relates to this point we talked about about selling, learn how to sell properly. You know, we don't push product out the door that we're not sure if the customer is going to like or want. You know, if, if we do a better job of asking more questions, we're more certain that we're making the right recommendations to their customers so that when they get at home, it's the right thing. If we're just pushing products instead of solutions, that's when returns and exchanges tend to go up. But the other side of the strategy, you know, there's a metric that you should track in your stores, especially in stores where you're getting a lot of returns and exchanges. What percentage of those returns and exchanges converted into a new sale? So that when a customer is coming back and returning and exchanging something, our job is to try to get them to buy something else. Keep in mind, you now know they have money, so that obstacle's out of the way, because you just gave them money back. Try to convert those customers to buying something else in your store. Awesome, great. Um, and another question, what sales numbers should or should not be shared with employees? Uh, I think you should sell, share everything with employees. Uh, we've got retailers that take literally profit and loss statements store by store out to the staff and show them what the sales and the margin and the expenses were, what the bottom line was or wasn't in mm -hmm. the store. Um, the more you're, we always say we want our staff to behave like they're in business for themselves. Yeah. Well, start to treat them like they're in business for themselves. Share with them as much as you possibly can. I know that's not going to fit everybody's mindset that's in here. I always say if you have staff that are working for you that aren't bright enough to figure out what your sales are, they're probably not bright enough to be working for you. Mm -hmm. uh, sales are sales are sales. It, it means nothing yeah, right sure. out there. So Definitely. share as much as you can. For sure. Um, and last question that we can get to for today, um, and this is regarding, I think, the slide that you mentioned, the, the duds, um, and getting rid of the duds, so avoiding that from the beginning. So what key traits and types of experiences should you look for when hiring salespeople? Um, it, that's a really open question, and, and I'll tell you the problem that I have with that is that it is so different for everybody that's mm -hmm. out there. But here, here's what I would, the, the, the easy answer is to say, if I had two people sitting at the table with me, one with eight years of relevant experience in my industry, mm -hmm. and a bad, did, didn't interview very well, not a great personality, and then somebody else comes in with limited, if any, experience in my industry, but is just, an, has an awesome personality. I'm hiring the person with the right attitude, the right personality, every single time over the person with experience. For sure. Because that, I can teach people the experience, I, I can teach them the skills, I can teach them the product knowledge, I can't teach them that sort of warm, welcoming personality. But if you want to get rid of the duds earlier on, go, go one step further, spend way more time in orientating your staff, give them the proper training right from day one. Great. Yeah, definitely agree with you on that part. Personality definitely plays a larger role in, in sales for sure. Great. Um, so that's definitely all the time we have now. Um, for any of the other questions that we didn't get to, um, our, the webinar will actually be posted on our website as well as on YouTube afterwards. Um, so it'll be there for reference. Um, I wanted to thank you, Kevin, again for um, being here and great presentation. Um, and we look forward to keeping in touch. Thank you, everybody over at Venn, and thank you to everybody that signed in with us today. It was great working with all of you. Great. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye now.